But to have people like this as friends, any life is blessed to have people of this magnitude as friends. So I want to say that. And then also to have them as colleagues and comrades, which engages your life at the level at which you live every day, the things that matter. And for us, it's black people, African people who matter, and our cousins in the central parts of Latin America, our ancestors and our brothers in our place of origin in the continent of Africa, and uh, our extended family in the Caribbean. To engage people at that level at which you see the world and the things that matter is an extraordinary value and you've heard from some of that, from some of them today. This may sound like it's extraordinary because it's focused around this occasion of my last year formally uh, as an educator. It sounds therefore like it's extraordinary or specialized, but the things you heard this panel talk about today is what we do every day. It's what we do amongst ourselves. What makes NCBS such an extraordinary and important organization, as I said to someone um, yesterday, is not only do we engage each other and exchange ideas, we find ways to like one another, to create an atmosphere in which we enjoy seeing each other from year to year as friends. I don't know many organizations like that. We, in spite of James calling me out like that, <laughs> about liking the style of what we did. See, I'm going to speak on that in a minute. <laughs> See, he's trying to hide on this Cleveland tip. See, I first encountered him up in Penn State, and I mean, he was the man, you know? But in any event, uh, uh, I was saying that we don't attempt to score points with each other for the point, for the purpose of scoring points, or talk about what societies we belong to, where what we've recently done the day before. And, and there are these people who belong to those societies. But that's not the way we mediate our relationship with one another. And we hope that that comes through today to most of all those of you who are in the upcoming and intermediate generations, you see. When Ron mentioned uh, about those people who have been a part of the way we have attempted to share our resources, was not something that is special to us. It's what we understood we had to do. There's a dialectical relationship between what a Cortland Cox and, and James Foreman and others were attempting to do, and those of us who stood in these universities and other places of employment where there was some resources to be had. It was our duty to see how we could extract and share resources. It wasn't some praiseworthy thing for us. It was our duty to do that. And that's what we try to say today. For those, in fact, who made it possible, because without SNCC, there would have been no black studies. Let's be clear, you understand? There would be no positions in the corporate 1,000. Huh? There would be no positions. It's all right to talk about where struggle is taking place in other places, and we honor that. But we must honor the struggle that has taken place here 
for us to be known. How is it possible for a James Turner, the son of a laboring class, not the working class, those black people at that time were the laboring class. They were not formally part of the working class, if you get what I mean. And many of us come from that. What would make it possible for me to come from a family of that class, out of the public housing projects, to be standing here at this august place? in this company. How did that happen? It was the intervention of the new abolitionists, the new liberation strugglers, those people who left Howard, who left Washington University like George, George Latin and others, and who went south to engage not only the overt enemy, those violent white terrorists that we knew in the Klan, but the structural base, the institutional base in law and practice, and made it an, om an omnipresent political issue at the national level, so that those in Washington could no longer ignore it, their complicity. That made it possible, brothers and sisters, for us to be happy, you know. It took a eight for 400, no, for four hours, about 225 miles northwest of New York, but it just could have been another planet from where I was coming from, you know. Lerone Bennett has an extraordinary comment in an essay that I think we all ought to read called Time, Space, and revolution, right, Howard? It's an extraordinary philosophical piece. But he makes a point where he says that between the slave and the slave master, they lived in different times and different places, though they occupied the same plantation. Mm. It took me a while to understand that. But if it was, I was then capable of taking that and mediating it in the classroom so that someone like Kimberly could come to understand it and then move to be a leading figure in the development of this important theory or theoretical school of critical race theory. What Scott articulates and also relates to Ron and James Stewart's comment is that we come from a tradition that is not second place. We come from a rich tradition of people who have advanced the notions of human rights when they had none themselves. We ought not take the value structure of those who mean us no good and apply it in our own community. We say they're not worth learning from because they have no title, right? They didn't go to the academy, but they laid the groundwork intellectually <laughs> And they fought the battle over maintaining our history when we didn't even believe there was any. Huh? So we need to understand our own traditions. And that's how we've tried to understand our role in, in black studies. So that uh, this afternoon's panel was a testament to them, our ancestors, via myself. This was just an occasion for us to talk about those people. You know, listen, Fannie Lou Hamer knew she was never going to be in any Cornell. But that wasn't her primary motivation. 
It's like Septa McClark and Rosa Park and these others. They hope one day their children would be there, literally and figuratively. And we are figuratively their children. They didn't expect that they would have these benefits, but they thought at least they'd make it possible for us and they had a deep and abiding faith that we would make a difference by being there. And it becomes important for us to maintain fidelity to that responsibility. And it's going to become critically important to hold some of these other black folks accountable as well. So I say thank you for this extraordinary honor, which as I said is beyond measure. Special thanks to all my friends and, and scholar colleagues on this panel. Al Colon, James Stewart, Ron Daniels, Kimberly Crenshaw, Scott Brown, and the inimical Dolores Aldridge. <laughs> right? It's made a difference in the South. I don't know how she stands with such grace and dignity at Emory. We are also having, at this point, to say a special thanks to NCBS, to its president, Santiago, and to the board of directors. I am deeply appreciative for their support and making this occasion possible. I also want us to take pride, not in an arrogant way, but take pride for those victories we have achieved. We don't want to laden down ourselves with the things that have slipped away or might see as defeats or challenges still, but we must claim our victories. As young people, as neophytes, our we started out some four decades ago talking about the need to engage power and white privilege and white mythology, Kimberly, in the knowledge enterprise, where these people, the Europeans, took their own particularist experience and tried to generalize it to the rest of the world. In fact, they took their practice and called it humankind or human relations. We started out as neophytes, but four decades later, we have established a vibrant, robust discipline in this country in American higher education. still battles to be fought, but that one has been won on the ground. Mm -hmm. I almost sometimes fall out of my chair when I get these, these book <laughs> announcements from the University of Mississippi <laughs> from Louisiana State, from Duke University, the University of North Carolina, let alone Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, and everything in Michigan State with all these black titles. Now y'all look at this and say, oh, wow, I'm going to order this and give me a, you know, a, a desk copy. I'm sitting there looking and saying, how oh, good is that, man? <laughs> these are these places that, you know, just a short while ago was dogging us to death. They were saying, we don't have a literary tradition. Y'all don't have nothing. Y'all don't even read books. We ain't gonna let you in the store. You couldn't go over the trench hole in Barnes and Nobles. Ain't that true? You know, I mean, come on. Everybody, it's an industry and the major profit making for man, not only university, but the commercial press. Random House, Oxford, Vintage, all of them. That's due to us, us writ large. And we need to claim that. 
We need to help our students and these younger intellectuals understand that the text they're reading come from that tradition, from that struggle. So it now could be there. Now people are coming here asking us, y'all got any manuscripts? Y'all got some proposals? Hello, y'all got, I get caught. You got some, give me anything. We got what you got, we'll wash it up for you. Don't worry, we got it anyway. Put it up together. Now when I'm young, am I lying? If I'm lying, I'm fine. So I want us to, to claim it. We need to be dedicated to the kinds of things that this panel has talked about in relationship to pedagogy and theory building and methodology. And we don't have to be overly enamored with Europe. There are some in our community who think that the only things important are what emanates from the ideas of Europe. Now don't get me wrong, oh, you're down on the Europeans. No, I, ain't, I ain't wasting that kind of time. You understand? But it's us. First it was structuralism. Then it was post-structuralism. Then it was modern. Then it was post-modern. Then it was coloniality. Then post-coloniality. Then there was... It. <laughs> Construction and de deconstruction. I mean, we ought to be ashamed to think that the only thing we're capable of doing is mimicking and, and, and parroting that. Sure, you learn from what there is to be offered. But you don't bypass what stands in your own tradition. And let alone reduce your own critical the ability to think to simply emulating with someone else. You ought to be thinking about theory, construction, and development itself. Now let me say something about theory, because there's some way that people think there's some kind of, you know, uh, wonder about theory. Theory is, you know. I mean, first of all, theory ain't but certain number, levels of speculation put together in a particular construction. Make right? There ain't no mystification there. And if that theory doesn't relate to empirical lived conditions and verified by the facts on the ground, then you simply sitting there talking to yourself in the walls. <laughs> So we need to, and in a situation of domination of, and oppression, if our work isn't oppositional and critical, it isn't doing what it ought to do. Black studies has always been, and I hope shall always be, related to lifting up our historical experience and using that as a window for analyses, bringing recognition and focus on our culture and development. And some of you sometimes get confused and think somehow you talk about exceptionalism and, and essentialism. We're talking about recognizing and respecting the cultural tradition. Look, for all of its imperfection, hip hop has dominated American popular culture for the last 30 years. For much of the 20th century, it was blues, jazz, and rhythm and blues, and soul. And a couple years ago on, on one of these music awards, What's the guy who's so well known for having, he helped uh, produce uh, Aretha and them, I think he's with Atlantic Records. Clyde, Clyde, Clyde Davis. It was being awarded for his life. He said, look, it has been my ple a pleasure and privilege to have worked with these artists. He said, all cultures travel the world whether it's the flamenco guitar or whether it's the Austrian ballet. He said, but the culture I've seen that has the most legs, that moves across boundaries of water and, 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 and national boundary, has been 
to African American culture. Now, I grew up in a period when the dominant notion was that black people had no culture. And that's hard to imagine if you watch us. <laughs> Even in the things we are inarticulate about. <laughs> the way we move our bodies. The way we become portraitures, if you will. You know, how, how we appear, you know, the architect of, of, of our dress, you know, all of that. And not to even talk about the way we use language. But we grew up in a period when they talked about black people had no culture. And we're hearing a revisit of that in the so-called culture of poverty the desperate structural institutional impoverishment of sectors of our community who are caught in permanent positions of poverty when there is no work, when work disappears, when work goes abroad. So the beautiful communities that we used to know in Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Detroit and all across the so-called industrial heartland are wastelands and devastated areas. They're now trying to label the black people's position there as a result of a culture of poverty. That somehow it's their culture that produces these economic results. We need to confront it. And for all due respect to Bill Cosby, he needs to be confronted and dealt with at this level. I'm going uh, to end by also pointing out something that James Stewart ended on. We must look at cyclical development. We have to look at the moment in the context of the past and the impending future. We must get a sense of ourselves in terms of how the stages are developing. And that's why I hope that some of us can have a further conversation with Brother Cortland Cox, who, as he has done so many times at critical junctures in our history, brought some challenging notions about how we look at these stages. So when he talked about this being the fourth stage, the next stage, we need to um, have the benefit of, of his thinking. And I hope that uh, you will all take advantage. And of course, lastly, and there's, there is Brother Howard Dotson, who represents so much of this tradition that has been spoken about today, and also Professor Mar Marcellus Barksdale, who's here from uh, Morehouse University as well. They also are part of this tradition and have been stellar in the contributions and the role they have made. Young men at Howard and Morehouse would have been a little less privilege than they are that had not been for Professor Barksdale. And, and we now know the pride that we look forward to, that we can now refer to the Schomburg. All you need to do is just say Schomburg. People around the world know what that means. And that also is a testament to Brother Howard. People sit here quietly, I'm assuming like Sister Rosemary Neely, who is here. And when you talk about this tradition of scholarship and artist uh, activism, this is one of the most dedicated persons who've been in that tradition. And you should know her as well. 
It's interesting, they're all sitting in the same side of the house, all in the room number one. It is how it is, really, it is called the cops with the warm box there, right? Marcellus box there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your attendance. Our time has expired. Uh, the next session starts at 2.